but we can start right now and then if she doesn't we'll make sure we're done by five okay um, we're, we're recording so you can go ahead yeah okay i just wanted to make sure she wasn't in the audience okay i'll try and keep an eye okay um, seeing a presence of a quorum of the Community Resources Committee, I'm calling this May 26th, 2022 meeting to order at 4.31 p.m. Um, pursuant to uh, Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Um, we're going to, at this time, make sure that the members of the committee can hear each other and be heard. So I'm just going to call a roll um, and I will start with Pat. Uh, present and I can hear. Hello. And Mandy is present. Jennifer. Present. I can hear. Thank you. And Pam Rooney will not be with us today, and we are hoping Shalini attends. Um, so we will keep a watch out for Shalini if she arrives. Um, at this time, I'm going to move to the public hearings, which is our first order of business. Um, the first one, and so we will start with those, and then at the end of that, I will talk about the rest of the agenda when we finish those, and we'll talk about them too during the hearings. So um at 4 32 p.m in accordance with the provisions of mgl chapter 40a i'm calling this public hearing of the i'm opening the public hearing of the community resources committee of the amherst town council which has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested residents to be heard regarding the following proposed amendments to the zoning bylaw Zoning bylaw Article 2, Zoning Districts, Article 3, Use Res Regulations, and Article 16, FEMA Floodplain Overlay District. To see if the town will vote to add Article 16, FEMA Floodplain Overlay District to the Zoning Bylaw, amend Article 2, Zoning Districts, to add FEMA Floodplain Overlay District, and amend, rela amend related sections of Article 3, Use Regulations, to regulate activities in the 100-year flood floodplain as shown on the flood insurance rate firm maps issued by the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, for the administration of the National Flood Insurance Program. Firm maps indicate areas that have a 1% chance of flooding in a given year. The purpose of the floodplain management regulations is to protect the public health, safety, and general welfare, and to minimize the harmful impacts of flooding upon the community. While I was reading that, um, I want to just check Shalini joined us. So Shalini, can you hear us and be heard? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to start the order for the public hearing will be board and committee member disclosures and then we're going to hear from the planning staff um, about sort of what is going on i'm not sure we're going to have a formal presentation today because the planning staff is going to talk about um the the current status of what we can and can't do um but once we hear that we will we do have jennifer moss here from i is it icom a e a e c o m to answer any questions we may have um so then we'll take some questions from the board and committee then we'll go to the public for questions and then we'll take public comment and then um after the public comment period, um, I will be making a motion to continue the hearing. Um, and I will, you'll find out more about why that is the case from Chris as she starts. I don't know whether it's going to be Nate or Chris when they explain um, what is going on and why we're going to need to continue a hearing. So, uh, any board and member disclosures? Seeing none, Chris. Good afternoon. Very nice to see you all. I wanted to give a general introduction to this project and I will include in it um, the information that Mandy was referring to. So hello, I'm Chris Brestrup, Planning Director, and I'm here to talk to you about our flood mapping project. Seems to me I've done this a few times before. <laughs> I have with me Senior Planner Nate Malloy and Project Manager at AECOM, Jennifer Moss. AECOM is our engineering consultant on this project. 
On February 28th, we gave a brief presentation to town council members about the project. And then on April 25th, town council referred the zoning portion of this project to the planning board and the CRC for public hearings. On May, May 2nd, the town council referred the firm maps, flood insurance rate maps, and the flood insurance study to the CRC for a recommendation. These are two different but associated items for the planning board, the CRC, and town council to consider and adopt. One has to do with zoning amendments, the text and the map, and the other has to do with the FEMA maps, the actual firm maps that are created by FEMA and the flood insurance study. So the town of Amherst is a participant in the National Flood Insurance Program, which is administered by FEMA. And the program provides flood insurance for property owners whose properties are subject to flooding. If the municipality in which the property is located participates in the National Flood Insurance Program. The town has been working on the project of updating these maps since 2012. And here it is um, 10 years later. So I'm hoping that we get through it in 2022. The purpose of the project is to create accurate maps that are federally approved for land affected by flooding in order to provide information for banks, landowners, conservation commission, planning board, and other in interested parties. Amherst flood maps were last updated in 1983. New and better technology for mapping flood prone areas is now, to, now available. And town meeting appropriated funds during several town meeting cycles to update the flood maps. The consulting firm AECOM was hired by the town and has been working with town staff and FEMA to create more accurate mapping of floodable areas along rivers and streams in Amherst. In September, 2017, the preliminary flood insurance rate maps were presented to members of the planning board, the conservation commission and the public. And at that time, the town became aware of a new method of analyzing flood data and determining flood boundaries. This new method had just come into use in the spring of 2017. The town decided to go ahead and appropriate additional funds to update the maps using this new method. And the new method mapping has now been completed and we've been through three appeal periods with only one appeal during the first appeal period. Most of these maps have been available for view since July of 2020 and recently revised panels, there are three of them, have been available for view since July of 2021. These maps were presented at public meetings, the last of which was held on June 25th, 2019. And at that time we sent notifications <clears throat> to all of those who's, who own property in the floodplain as depicted on the new maps. The old maps were based on USGS topography with 10 foot contours. They were also based on data gathered up until the early 1970s. The new maps are based on town GIS topography, which is very accurate at one foot contours. And the new maps are also based on more recently gathered data. This means that the new maps are much more accurate in terms of where flooding occurs. So what action steps does the town need to take? The town needs to adopt the firm maps that were produced by AECOM in coordination with FEMA, and they also need to adopt the flood insurance study. The town also needs to adopt the zoning amendment that we are presenting and changes to the official zoning map. Staff with the assistance of our state flood hazard coordinator, Joy Dupereau at DCR, has developed an amendment to the zoning bylaw, which we are calling Article 16, FEMA Floodplain Overlay District. And we've also developed an amendment to the official zoning map, showing areas that will be included in the floodplain overlay district. The zoning amendment and changes to the map have been proposed because for municipalities that are part of the flood insurance program, these municipalities need to show that they can and do manage and control development in flood prone areas. We had hoped to receive our letter of final determination from FEMA with a final set of firm maps by early May. However, due to an issue with paperwork at the federal level, the letter of final determination won't arrive till later on this summer. And that's the um, 
thing that Mandy was referring to, the little glitch in or fly in our ointment. Um, so we're meeting today to hold the first session of the public hearing regarding the zoning amendments and the first session of a discussion about the firm maps and the flood insurance study. We'll be back to you later this summer or early fall to continue the discussion. So what will happen if we don't adopt the flood maps? If the town fails to adopt the new flood maps, the town of Amherst will no longer be able to participate in the flood insurance program. And people in Amherst will not be able to purchase flood insurance through the flood insurance program. In your packets, you received copies of the presentations that Jennifer and Nate had given in earlier this year. And if you'd like to hear those presentations again, Nate and Jennifer are here to give them. But whether or not we review the presentations, I recommend that you use the rest of the time today to hear questions and concerns from the public and to ask questions and make comments on the project yourselves. And then continue the public hearing until a date, probably in September. I'm sure Mandy has a date uh, in mind. And by telling us your questions and concerns today, we'll be better able to um, make a full presentation um, when the time comes. I would like to address an issue that's been brought up by some uh, council members as well as members of the public with regard to Tan Brook. Um, these people have raised concerns that there is no floodplain shown in the Tan Brook panel, in uh, one panel in the center of town, um, and it's not included in the floodplain mapping. So I'd like to tell you a little about that. Um, FEMA has a threshold for mapping that requires that an area be at least one square mile of watershed in order to be mapped. The Tanbrook does not have an area of one square mile of watershed. The Conservation Commission recently had a discussion about Tanbrook and they and the DEP are working on an issue of whether Tanbrook watershed exceeds one half a square mile of watershed. And that relates to its potential designation as a perennial stream but that's different from whether or not it can be mapped by FEMA. Um, aside from the fact that Tanbrook doesn't qualify based on the watershed size, there are some facts that I'd like to share with you with regard to having a floodplain designation on your property. First of all, anyone who owns property in a municipality that participates in the firm flood insurance program may purchase flood insurance and Amherst, we hope, will continue to participate in that program. So whether or not your property is mapped as having a floodplain on it, you can still purchase flood insurance through this program. Um, second thing is that flood insurance doesn't cover your whole property, it only covers the building. So if some people along Tanbrook are noticing that parts of their property are being flooded, um, that wouldn't be covered by uh, flood insurance, only the building itself, or if you have an outbuilding that would be covered. And another thing is most property owners would be more likely to request their properties to be taken out of the flood zone rather than being added to the flood zone for several reasons. One is that there can be a decrease in the value of a property that's shown to be in a flood zone. Another one is that properties that are in the flood zone may be required to purchase flood insurance in order to obtain a mortgage or get a home equity loan. And the third is that properties shown to have a flood zone on them are subject to more scrutiny when they're making changes to their property. And they may need to apply to the Conservation Commission for permission to make those changes. Since the 100 year floodplain is considered a wetland resource area under the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act. Um, so uh, in terms of the vote that would be needed eventually on this, um, the adoption of the zoning amendment and the changes to the official zoning map would require a two thirds vote of town council. And I understand that the adoption of the firm maps and the flood insurance study, study would require a majority of the town council. Thank you for holding this important public hearing today. And we'll be happy to answer any questions and um, that you or the public may have about this project. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Chris, um, the explanation of everything and all. Um, with that, um, we are going to go, we're going to go directly to questions from the committee. Um, 
I, I do thank Nate and Jennifer for being here. The presentations, as I said, as Chris said, are in the packet. And so we've, as a committee, seen this multiple times. So I think we'll dispense with the formal presentation and see if we've got any questions regarding the, um, this is the zoning overlay district. This, does, this, this is not the hearing for the map that will be after we make a motion on this particular hearing. We noticed these as two separate hearings. So this is any changes to the actual sort of wording of the addition of the overlay district um, and the articles two and three zoning districts and use regulations. Shalini. Yeah, thank you again, uh, Chris. That was really helpful to get that summary. You mentioned there was one concern or something like that. There was just one concern in, is that the word? I don't know what's the word you use, but it sounded like there was one concern that was raised um, by a resident and also by counselors. Is that what it was? Or was that the Tan Brook thing? May I answer that? Chris, yep. Yeah, that has to do with Tanbrook and why okay. Tanbrook wasn't included and okay. why there was a blank panel sure. in the center of town. So that was the concern. That, that was, was the only one. There's yeah. no other, no one else has written about, um, yeah, about their property mm -hmm. being impacted or anything. Nope. Okay, thank you. I'm seeing no other questions. We're going to move to, where's my order? We're gonna to move to questions from the public. So at this time, if there are any members of the public that have any questions related to the FEMA floodplain overlay district that is proposed for article 16, or the related changes to articles two or three and three in the zoning bylaw, please raise your hand at this time. Seeing no questions from the public, we will then move to public comment. If there's any members of the public who would wish to comment on the proposed Article 16 FEMA floodplain overlay district or the related changes to Articles 2 and 3 of the zoning bylaw, please raise your hand at this time. Seeing no hands, um, I'm going to give the CRC members another opportunity to ask any questions at this time. Um, and as I do that, I'm also going to state that my intention is to continue this hearing until September 8th, 2022. That's the motion I'm going to make. Um, that's our first scheduled meeting in September. Um, the reason we are continuing instead of closing is because if we close the hearing, the council has to vote within 90 days. And if it does not, we have to notice another public hearing. And since it is not expected that we will receive the letter of final determination within those 90 days, um, we would rather not have to spend the money to notice another public hearing. So we are going to continue the hearing until hopefully we'll have received that letter of final determination. Um, and then we will obviously have at that time another opportunity to look at these again, potentially with changes if the firm maps or whatever happens changes in the meantime with the between now and when we get that letter. So Jennifer. Uh, no, first, I just want to thank um, Christine because uh, Tambrook is in part of it's in my district and I really appreciate this information. If anybody asks me a question, I feel like now I can answer it completely. So I really appreciate that. It was very understandable. And I just wanted to ask, just out of curiosity, so the last public hearing was in uh, June of um, 2019. And what I heard was that we were already using the new GIS topography. So why, um, so what happened between then and like why the lag between then and now? Chris? Um, we went through three appeal periods. And during the first appeal period, there was an appeal of a property on Meadow Street. 
uh, the landowner um, appealed that designation and um, it took a while to get that all settled. And then we went through another appeal period there was, uh, which I think there was a problem that was unearthed by FEMA. And so they had to resolve that. And then we had a last appeal period and that one was settled with no issues at all. So that took a long time. And it, even though FEMA and AECOM give us an estimate of how long things are gonna take, I think that um, those estimates are very, how can I say this? <laughs> Right now, those estimates are not uh, realistic given COVID because people are all working remotely and things take a lot more time than they normally do. So I think that's why there's been such a delay. And do we, we're not anticipating any appeals going forward? No, the last appeal period ended, I believe it was December 9th of 2021. Okay. So that's it. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Seeing no other hands, I'm going to move to continue the public hearing on zoning bylaw article two, zoning districts, article three, use regulations, and article 16, FEMA floodplain overlay district to until September 8th, 2022 at 4 30 p.m. Is there a second? Second, Jalini. Uh, any comments or questions? Seeing none, um, we're gonna vote. Uh, Shalini. Yes. Pat. Aye. Uh, Mandy is an aye. Uh, Jennifer. Aye. That is four to zero with one absent. Thank you for that. We are now moving on to our second public hearing in accordance with the provisions of MGL Chapter 40A. Uh, this public hearing of the Community Resources Committee of the Amherst Town Council has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested residents to be heard regarding the following proposed amendments to the zoning bylaw. Zoning bylaw official zoning map FEMA floodplain overlay district to see if the town will vote to amend the official zoning map to add the FEMA floodplain overlay district for the purpose of regulating activities as described in Article 16 FEMA floodplain overlay district. It is um, 4.53 is the time we are opening this public hearing. So again, are there any disclosures? Seeing none, Chris, would you like to add anything regarding the map? I would like to ask Nate to make some comments about the map, and I don't know if someone wants to put that map up on the screen, but I think that would be helpful, and then Nate can um, talk about it. Nate, would you like to put that on the screen too? Sure, I have that. Um, let's see, I have, I had a few, I have all the packets pulled up, I just have to find the right tab. Yep. Um, so is that is that visible? The yes, yes. Map? Great. So thanks, everyone. Nate Maloya, planner with the town. So the um, as Chris mentioned, there's a few pieces to the project. One is um, you know the the flood insurance study and the flood maps. And so you know FEMA has the official map panels, right, where you can go onto the FEMA website, and the Conservation Commission will use that. And then there are local regulations to manage development in the floodplain. So as part of updating the new maps, the state and FEMA require that we have regulations in place. And so we're using our zoning bylaw, you know, to have, have those regulations. And that, that includes um, an overlay district where the new maps, you know, that shows a new floodplain area. So you can, you can use the FEMA maps to see this. And then it, this will also become part of the zoning bylaw where there's an overlay district. Uh, and then article 16, the, the text, the narrative regulates what happens in this area. So um, on the map, uh, you can see here the, 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 Black um, cross hatching is from the 1980s, uh, 1981 and 1983 maps, and then the blue color shows the uh, 2022 proposals. And so, you know, it's roughly the same area in town um, as Chris mentioned with the new uh, one-foot topography. You know, there's also 40 years of data that FEMA has collected. So in New England, in Region One, and also in New York State, there's been in-stream gauges. So they actually measure stream flow during flood events 
that help FEMA um, develop new formulas um, to help calculate the floodplain. So, you know, if we zoom in certain areas in town, it's just um, previously, for instance, uh, you know, the outline using the 1980s maps, you know, sometimes they actually went uphill or they just, you know, they weren't as accurate. So now using all this new information, um, the boundaries of the floodplain are a lot more accurate. So it shows the floodway. If you look closely, it actually shows, you know, the floodway where the river is, and then it shows the, you know, the 1% chance of flooding. So the 100 year flood uh, is the boundary of the blue. And so this map will be adopted as part of our official zoning map. And our official zoning map is actually online. It's our online GIS. And so this will become a layer in our GIS um, viewer. So homeowners or applicants, contractors can you know, turn this layer on and see it. Uh, the Conservation Commission will also use it, as Chris mentioned, for part of their review for projects. So um, you know, when we have the new map, we have the language, and then we have this map. And so one piece of the language that you um, in the FEMA in the state asks is that any project in the floodplain uh, get a permit or be reviewed and checked off by the town. And so most of the time that means the Conservation Commission will review a project. Uh, you know, it could be planning board or zoning board too for land use permits, but there may be a few types of projects that wouldn't require any, any permit. Um, it's very, it'd be very rare, but you know, we're gonna have this, um, this overlay. And so then with our permitting software, this will become a, you know, a checklist, a question that will be on applications. And so, you know, it just helps the, you know, the town verify um, the types of projects that are happening. So for instance, someone in this area couldn't do a lot of earthwork, couldn't, you know, take down trees or, or, you know, move a lot of earth, bring in fill without getting a permit if they're in the floodplain. Um, so that may also require review by the Conservation Commission, but by having these maps here, it'll help us identify where, you know, where a project is taking place. Um, and so, you know, this relates, you know, these are, this, this is actually the same as the, the firm maps, but it's part of our zoning and it's not, you know, but it should be really, really similar to the, the FEMA maps that show the, you know, uh, the flood boundaries. Thank you, Nate. Um, are there any questions from the CRC members? Um, I have one. I just want to make sure I'm clear on the map itself. The blue is the overlay district, not the crosshatched section. Right. Right. The crosshatching was the pre is the current, you know, the 80s maps, and that was just to show where there could be some differences in terms of location on the ground. So, when it's an overlay district, it'll be just the blue will become the you know the boundary of the the flood. Yep. That's what I thought, but I wanted to make sure. <laughs> Any other questions? Seeing none, we're going to move to questions from the public. If there's any members of the public that have questions regarding the zoning map proposed change to add the overlay district and what it would cover, please raise your hand at this time. Seeing none, if there are any members of the public that have any comments to make regarding the proposed changes to the zoning map to add the overlay district and where that overlay district is located, please raise your hand. Seeing none, any other questions from the border committee, the CRC members? Seeing none, then I will make a motion to continue this hearing. And the hearing on zoning bylaw, official zoning map, FEMA flood, flood, flood plain overlay district until September 8, 2022 at 4.35 p.m. Second to Angelus. Thank you, Pat. And with that, I'm going to be leaving. Thank you. <laughs> Can we take the vote first? <laughs> we'll start with Pat, seeing no hands. <laughs> aye. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Mandy is an aye, Jennifer. Aye. And Shalini. Yes. That is four to zero with one absent. Thank you, Pat, for coming. And she's already gone. Thank you. Um, actually, we're not quite probably done with Jennifer and Nate yet, although there have not been many questions, so I'm not sure we're going <laughs> to, we appreciate you coming. Um, that takes care of our hearings for the day. Um, there are two other items that are on the agenda that were related to this um, under action items. 
The, the first was that um, we would discuss and make recommendations on the proposed zoning bylaw changes. Well, we haven't closed the hearing, so we're going to avoid that item, which is action item 3A. We're going to postpone that until we actually close the hearings. Um, and item 3B is the flood insurance rate maps, the firm maps, and the flood insurance study, which is, as Chris described during the first hearing, the other two parts of what we need to make recommendations on. We had received that referral two weeks after we received the referrals on the zoning bylaw, and we need to make a recommendation to the council on those. Um, we will not be making any recommendations today because we cannot make, we the council cannot pass and adopt those maps and insurance study until it receives that letter of final determination. At least that's what I've been told. And so since there's always a possibility that they might change between now and when we receive that letter, it doesn't seem appropriate to make a recommendation to the council. We will postpone that recommendation part of this item until we've closed the public hearing and are ready to re make recommendations on all four items after the letter has been received. But we can have a discussion today if there are any questions regarding the maps and the flood insurance study. We've got Jennifer here, we've got Nate here, and we've got Chris here to talk about and ask those questions and get any more clarification that we need. Chris. I thought it might be helpful if Jennifer described what the flood insurance study is, what it represents and why we need to adopt it. And, and also if either Nate or Jennifer could show um, some of the panels. And so we all become familiar with the panels because those are the things that you're going to have to adopt as the firm maps. And you know we don't have to get into a lot of detail, but I think it would be helpful if um, you all kind of looked at those maps and asked questions about them if you have any questions, because they're different from the map that Nate just showed in the sense that they have different kinds of information on them. Although the firm, the floodplain is the same, but the information, the way it's shown is different. Thank you for that. Jennifer, would you like to start with what Chris asked for <laughs> to explain to us what that insurance study is? <laughs> Sure, sure. Um, Nate, do you have it pulled up um, as I talk or do you want me to grab it? I'm just getting onto the FEMA's website here to pull it up. I'm trying to get on FEMA too, so I don't, I don't have, I'm not. You could pull it up there. from our website. Yeah, I was, I was, I was, I was, you know, I was hoping to show it um, through the FEMA map center just to. Here. The official. <laughs> Let me share my Green share. All right. Can you all see the FEMA Flood Map Service Center site? Yes. Excellent. Great. So, you know, just a little bit of background about what FEMA hosts on this site. So, what the town has um, on their site, FEMA is also hosting it. Um, this is FEMA's official location for all things that or legally binding or effective and up and coming preliminary. So you can just see I've searched through just, they've got great little drop downs, um, got to the town of Amherst and you can see you've got your effective products. So these are what you have now from 1983 um, and what's upcoming. So they're still called preliminary because we have not finalized them. And so what we have on this, on this site you'll see you've got firm panels and your FIS reports, right? And this is just giving you, this is all the, the legal background information that, that FEMA likes to have. Um, it explains to you details about the study. So it, it explains, you know, the responsibility of the community um, to update and, and maintain these maps. It describes what, what the zone information is. Um, it's going to give you information, you know, that you already know, but, but scope of study and community description um, talks about some of the principal flood problems. Um, it talks about, you know, flood protection measures that you, that you may have, and then describes the engineering methods and methodology that, that FEMA uses in all of their studies. So it gives you some more detail and describes what FEMA has done. Also gives a lot of the background and the, the engineering details that someone would need if, 
if there was land development um, in a floodplain and, and someone was trying to evaluate what the impacts of that development would be, they would come and they would use this report. Um, they would find, you know, how, how does the water flow? Um, you know, how is, how is the analysis done so they can recreate that analysis as a part of their, um, their requirements? Um, talks about the vertical datum and then how how these floodplain boundaries were created. So it gives you a lot of the background details. Talks about what the zones are, um, what the map is designed for, and then the history of of the maps in 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 Amherst. So you know you'll you'll have that report that it leaves, and then of course the the maps themselves have changed quite a bit. Let me open this one from 2021. These are can be a little bit large, six six and a half megabytes. Um, tried to pick a smaller smaller one of the bunch here for you. While that's downloading, FEMA also has um, their National Flood Hazard Layer Viewer. So if if someone in your community is more um, tech savvy and they're interested in seeing where the floodplains are, they can always come to this, this national viewer um, and type in their address. This one takes a little bit, little bit to load. Um, yeah, you can see that the maps are here. And again, this is gonna give an engineer or a surveyor all the information that they need if, they're, if there's gonna be some plan development. You know, what do they need to look for? Um, it'll also help your residents understand and assess their risk. You know, for emergency management purposes, these maps will tell you, you know, is the, is the roadway going to remain open? Um, so, you know, there's a lot of applications of this data beyond just this insurance piece. And so, you know, that's what you can, um, you know, that's what it looks like and, and that's what you can glean from it. So. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of, uh, Chris, I see your hand. <laughs> I just wanted to mention that these maps are also available on our town website. And I think that um, the reports that you've gotten from um, the town manager um, have links to these maps. And so, you know, it'd be interesting for you to go in and study them because I think they're very revealing. They show um, street names, they, sh they show uh, houses, they show barns, they show a lot of things that are on the landscape so you can kind of find your way. Um, this particular uh, map that we've chosen here is actually interesting because it's been the subject of a lot of controversy over the years. It's the um, Meadow Street property owned by uh, Andrews and Lavertier. And um, so uh, that map has changed and there have been um, uh, changes to the flood zone and the brown areas, I should point out, are uh, the 500-year flood zone and the blue areas are the 100-year flood zone. So, you know, I encourage you to go in and study these maps and, um, you know, really see how they uh, how they are so much more accurate than the older maps. And um, it, it's really interesting to look at them. So, yeah, quickly, I'll just jump in. Jump in again. Hi, Nate uh, Malloy, for those if there's new viewers. Um, so yeah, yeah, so the orange or brown color is outside, um, you know, the the what the overlay is. So the overlay map that I showed you that's townwide will just cover the the blue area, blue green area, and then the the red hatched area, which is the actual um, flood, you know, floodway. And so um, you know, this has does have a lot of information. The old maps are also um, not over aerial images. So this, you know, this information is um, over you know um, aerial imagery, so you can have a more accurate um, idea of where a structure is located. So you know on the current maps, the 83 maps, it's almost it's it's you're guessing quite a bit about where a structure may be. So here, um, the maps are um, the FEMA maps are um, 24 by 36, so they're actually pretty large sheets of paper if you printed them, and um, you can zoom in you know digitally too online, and so you can get a better picture of where a structure may be in relationship to the flood boundary. Um, and then the elevations, you know, like if you can see like 153.2, uh, and you can see the cross elevations of the um, of, of that area, a surveyor can use that then and go in onto a property and determine if it's really close, if, if a structure is or isn't in, um, in the flood zone. So, you know, these new maps are a lot more user friendly in terms of providing information than the, the current maps we're using. 
And I just wanted to point out that if anybody's interested in looking at the real paper maps, we have them in the office and people are welcome to come in and look at them. Thank you. Are there any questions from CRC members? Um, comments, thoughts? Seeing none, I want to say I think it the lack of questions means you guys did a fantastic job and we trust everything you've done. Um, <laughs> Thank you. It's, it's not that we're not interested. I actually find looking at the maps myself fascinating. Um, and I've done it multiple times in multiple areas. But um, I, I think it's just that you guys have done so much work on this and that, that you know, bringing us along with the multiple presentations from Chris and Nate at the council and all um, has really answered all the questions probably that we have. And so that makes our work so much easier. Um, but it's not that we're not interested. So um, seeing that there aren't any questions, thank you, Jennifer, for coming um, and, and being able and willing to talk about this and to be here to answer any questions if we had had some. Um, we will put this one back on the agenda for that September meeting too, because um, the goal is to make a recommendation on all four of those parts at the same meeting um, so that it goes to the council all at once. So we've already got a por portion of our September 9th agenda set. Um, and, and we'll see if the letter of determination is not there in time, um, we will still have to open the two hearings that were continued, we will open them and then we will continue them on um, to another date, but the, the other portion of what should be on that agenda would not appear on the agenda um, for that reason. Um, did I cover everything, Chris and Nate and Jennifer? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I wanna thank, I think Nate and Jennifer might be done for the day. So I wanna thank, thank you all for coming and thank for you. being willing to answer all our questions. We're going to move on mm -hmm. at this time. Um, so I think Chris is going to stay on because we've got rental registration coming up. Um, we have, I just want to, Steve is in the audience. I know he's part of rental registration. I indicated that rental registration would not start before 530 um, because that we would do ZBA appointment stuff first. Um, so Steve, you get to hang out for a little bit longer because um, we're going to wait for a couple more people to arrive. Um, before we move on to the residential rental bylaw portion. Um, so we're going to move on to the ZBA appointment recommendations. Um, so a couple things as we move on to this one. Um, last meeting, we declared the pool sufficient to at least do what we're doing today. Um, I know when we declared that, we were very concerned um, that the pool may or may not actually be sufficient. Um, so. I, as you saw, sent out a survey regarding interview dates. The only people that have responded to that survey from what I have seen at this point are committee members. Um, so um, I, there's one more I haven't looked because we were in the middle of this meeting. There, there may be one person who is not a committee member that has responded because I just saw an email that says there's another response. Um, I today emailed the town manager um, seeking help with finding applicants and getting people to apply for ZBA. And I just wanted to let the committee know that, um, that I, I asked him and he has agreed to review the CAFs that have been submitted for non-council appointments. So there are two separate CAFs and to have um, his staff review them and contact me or contact them if they find anyone that has applied there that may be, um, um, may be interested because of what they said or, or have, have disclosed any qualifications um, to see if they might be to talk to them either through me or through his office um, to see if they might be interested in submitting a CAF for the ZBA. Um, so I wanted to let the committee know that I have done that so that if things start coming in or, or people hear stuff that it's not a surprise to the committee. Um, but, you know, I, I think we are all worried about the sufficiency of this pool. And so I, I, I went to the manager and said, hey, can you help us? Um, and he has agreed to help us. So I am hopeful that we will have 
a better applicant pool by the time we get to interviews. Um, See, right now, it looks like given that survey and given where we are, that we will tentatively plan interviews for the 23rd of June, which is our last June meeting um, of the CRC. Um, so I, I will not set that in stone until I've hopefully heard from others to make sure people can do that. But the June 9th, is it June 9th? June 9th is pretty much off the table right now, given that um, we don't really have applicants. Um, so I, I'm going to be aiming for June 23rd. So with that, we have two things we need to adopt. The first one is selection guidance. And um, the 2021 selection guidance that was adopted has been put in your packet. Um, I can put that on the screen if people would like. Um, and it is, it is the same, it is put in your packet like that and there is no other additional to that um, because the response that was received from, um, let me see if I can find it, from the chair of the ZBA um, regarding a request regarding that input um, is that, um, the selection guidance, this is the chair that has given the selection guidance for last times too. And his response this time was that response um, is still my response basically. <laughs> um, so there, there seemed to be no need to, to add that into the selection guidance. He basically confirmed what last year's selection guidance was. Um, so are there any questions regarding the selection guidance? If people would like me to put it on the screen, I will. Um, otherwise, we can just chat about it without it on the screen. It is in the packet. Seeing no questions, I'm going to just make a motion to adopt the um, ZBA selection guidance um, as presented in the document. Um, as the selection guidance as adopted on October 12th, 2021. Second, Jennifer Taub. Any questions, uh, Shalini? Yeah, I was just looking at the, the recommendations by the chair and just overall what we've decided and it looks fine. It's just that like if we, if you're looking for more diversity and all of that, it sounds like we need to know what's already, who's already there in the CBA, or are we just saying that in the pool we should, I mean, which is not a very large pool to begin with. So, I mean, what does that really mean, that that criteria? Um, which part of the criteria, the A or the B? One second, let me open it. It says the chair of the CBA highlighted some items when making appointment, or B. So geographic, okay. economic, age, employment, uh, diversity, and then back, I mean, just generally background in housing. Okay, okay, that's more specific to the pool, like whether they have, like we want a diversity in the pool with respect to different fields like construction, design, and all of that. But the first one, uh, geographic, economic, age, residence, overall i mean I, I was just wondering if we should have a sense of who's already there in the current cba and what we're looking for are we yeah so so what i can say is if we would like that sense it probably doesn't belong in the selection guidance but it can be provided to the committee during deliberations uh, after interviews um we've done that before mm. with other appointments um what um the current chair of the ZBA has emphasized many times is that in geographic diversity, um, the chair has felt that there are that, that the members are concentrated close to downtown and that it would be beneficial to the ZBA to have members that live throughout the entire town instead of in a much smaller or what has been perceived as a much smaller mm -hmm. geographical area of Amherst instead of encompassing the entire geographical area of Amherst. Mm. Um, we don't tend to ask information about where in Amherst people live, not even on the CAFs, I don't think. I think we just yeah. ask. I, I can look at the CAFs again. Um, we, we ask age on the CAFs. 
Um, so that is something we could find. And then the other items could potentially go to the questions um, of applicants if we wanted to ask questions regarding that. Um, some of that should be brought out in SOIs in some sense in terms of their mm. experience and background. Right. Um, sometimes it's done that way. But um, yeah, so I would say that if we are, if we would like what could be done is to, as we get closer to interviews, see if the chair can provide sort of um, some information related to that first bullet point of current members, if it's possible mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Jennifer. No, I think that's a very good su suggestion. I mean, we can't know if we're diversifying if we don't know who's already on it. So that would be helpful to know. Um, and I think the geographic diversity is very important. And I'm wondering if we could know if both these questions could also apply when we do the planning board interviews. Um, because I find it, it's interesting. I didn't realize that the ZBA tends to have a preponderance of people that live near downtown, because I think it's almost the somewhat the opposite on the planning board. So it would be good for both boards to have geographic and other diversity. So yeah, I can put it on the list of things to potentially ask the chairs of each of the committees um, to see if they can provide that for the current members um, as we move into deliberations um, to help us with that, you know, in terms of like how many live north of North Amherst, South Amherst, downtown, Am you know, central Amherst, east. Right. It could be that general. We don't need to you know, know what. That general, <laughs> obviously we, we could find the ages and all, but um, I, I think it's more to the geographic and then, you know, economic depends on how we'd be looking for, um, in past we've asked about rental status and all because economic diversity is, is just hard to imagine with any, you know, with just an income or anything. Um, but I can think about a way to formulate that question to the two chairs and, and see if we can obtain some of that information regarding the current members um, to move forward with as we move into deliberations regarding after interviews. Jennifer, your hand is still up. No, I was just gonna say, I think, you know, it's a hard one because like with the ZBA, you know, you need, you do want people that have an expertise on the board, but I know when I read it, you know, you feel like you almost have, to, which may be what, what is needed, but almost to be a professional in certain areas. Like I can see why we haven't gotten that many applicants because I, I certainly wouldn't feel qualified to be on the ZBA based on the criteria. And that, you know, I know that you do need people with expertise. So it's tough. Yeah. Okay. Uh, seeing no other questions or comments, we have a motion on the table to adopt the guidance, the selection guidance as it was adopted, you know, and presented. So essentially the same guidance as was adopted in October, on October 12th, 2021. Um, so it looks like we're ready for a vote. I'm gonna start with Jennifer. Uh, yes, aye. Shalini? Yes. And Mandy is an aye. Um, and Pat and Pam are absent. So that is unanimous with two absent. We will move on to, um, where's my agenda? Um, interview questions. So this one came late, um, similar to what I did to Athena earlier today. Um, Pam had thought she'd sent me the draft and it never got sent to me in Athena. Um, I, I did that to Athena with next week's planning board interview agenda. I thought I sent it on Monday and I never had. So I'm sorry it was late in the packet. Um, so I'm going to pull those questions up because I've always found that potentially helpful as we, um, at, as we discuss and potentially modify any of these questions. So let me get those on the screen. Why does this do that? Okay. okay. So these are the draft interview questions. Um, I believe Pam based them on the prior questions. Um, 
so let let's take a moment to read them and then talk about whether there are any we would like to see changed, um, added, deleted, things like that. Um, we had requested questions from the public, uh, from the committee, the council, um, and as far as I know, none were received, or if they were, they would be in this document from Pam. So, um, Jennifer. Uh, and the last three questions that are highlighted, is there, is that, um, you know, cueing us? <laughs> I, I actually don't know why they might be. So number six would be the one we added to the planning board question last week. So it is probably based on, it was probably put in this draft based on the addition two weeks ago to the planning board set of interview questions. Um, it was not in the last time we asked applicant, and that last time the CRC adopted interview questions for ZBA. Um, and so. And is seven and eight, is that? So eight would have been very similar to what was there. Um, I don't, I, it might just be held over because of the numbers changed. They don't look any different than um, any of the other questions that were there before. So I, 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 my guess is it might just be a holdover from something. Okay, then question five where it says, or are we supposed to decide whether we want either or or both? Number five. So, you know, I don't know what Pam was thinking on this. Um, so I think what she saw is number five um, was the question that was asked of ZBA candidates the last time we in CRC interviewed ZBA candidates, but she saw the planning board question that was similar was what she's got in italics. Um, and so my guess is her, her thing was one or the other, probably not both. If I had to guess what her attention is with the or. Um, so thoughts, Jennifer? Well, I, I definitely think we should have what's in italics. Um, the, the first part, you know, it's a good question, but I kind of, if I was asked the question, I'd say everyone. It's, you know, that's a, it's a bit of a leading question. <laughs> but I, I, I do, I would, um, I would like to see the uh, second portion in italics included. I think that's relevant. Shalini, what are your thoughts? What, the question number five? So, yeah, so what Jennifer just said was she would be okay deleting that, hmm. but she wants to keep this. Hmm. Or, or I, probably both would be the best, but if it was a right, feeling. Right, right, right. Okay, give me another moment to think about it. So I think in some sense, if we don't have a large applicant pool, both would be quite interesting. Um, if we're not concerned about number of questions, right? That's always the trying to keep the number of questions down to keep the time of these down. Um, I vaguely remember the last time we asked question number five of ZBA applicants that we got some quite um interesting and diverse answers um that that it was not a it was not a simple answer from any one of everyone of course you know it was well, then i think you like, keep it it was an it, it, a lot of the candidates i my my vague recollection is candidates expounded on like thoughts about all of it and it was one of the ones where we were like oh this one kind of actually worked is you know like <laughs> then let's keep it shalini is that your recollection yeah. too um, no, I don't have any recollection, actually, zero, zero recollection at this point, but I do like the question, though. I think it's a very important one. Um, I'd love to hear what, how people think about I mean, the first part. I was talking about the first part. The second one, part is more technical, and um, they should know about it, but I think the first one is more like a process question to me that's uh, always interesting and important to me. So, yeah. Jennifer? Yeah, I was just going to put another plug for both because I, I, I'm I very interested in how they how they would answer the second or what just their feelings are about it. 
so here's my proposal. It's nine questions, eight that could take, I, I assume we're going to change the two, to two to three minutes like we did with the planning board on that. Eight could take a while if we end up with a whole lot of candidates. And so my proposal is to adopt these as is. And then when we've got a final pool um, or closer to when we might have a ability to make that decision that maybe we revisit if we think we might end up with four hours of interviews you know, because of all the questions to see if there's any we would like to delete. But for now, um, keep them all and and make a decision depending on the size of the pool. So with that, I'm going to make the motion to adopt the um, the interview questions for the upcoming ZBA applicant interviews as amended at today's meeting. Is there a second? Uh, second. Um, seeing no other comments or raised hands, um, uh, we're going to go to a vote. I think we're back around to Shalini. Yes. Mandy is a yes. Um, Jennifer. Yes. Um, that passes three to zero. with two absent. Um, that brings us now to, I think we've got nearly everyone here now. Um, so Steve McCarthy's in the audience. Um, Athena, can you bring him in? And the question I have is, is the Rob in the audience, Rob Mora? If it is, please raise your hand, Rob, in the audience. It is, okay, without the last name, I wasn't sure. So Athena, can you bring Rob in too? Um, without the last name, Rob, I wasn't sure. Um, okay, so we are going to move on to our residential rental bylaw. Um, I think we've got nearly everyone here that is coming. Um, I thank Steve for coming from IT. Um, and Rob and John, um, we may get Steve Roof from ECAC. He wasn't sure he could attend or not, depending on timing, but he did send some stuff over from ECAC. Um, and I don't know whether Stephanie's going to join us or not. I know she was on the invite list um, as requested. Um, so we'll see. And I have not heard from Michelle to see if Michelle will be here or not. Um, so I think we've got nearly everyone on today's discussion list. Uh, Rob. Uh, sorry, Mandy. I just wanted to mention that Steve McCarthy is the licensing coordinator oh. of Inspection Services. Uh, he is very familiar with our programming and does the, the customized setup for each of our programs. Uh, if there happens to be something that we need IT support for, he'll be the one to be able to uh, get those answers or bring uh, the right person from IT at a future time. Thank you for clarifying Steve's role. Sorry for giving you the wrong department, Steve. I apologize for that. Um, That's perfectly fine. Thank you, Mandy. And thank you for uh, keeping us updated on the progress of the meeting as it went along here. <laughs> um, so yeah, so today's the, the plan for discussion is to discuss application process and requirements. Um, what we would want to see, what, what we would want um, property owners to be required to disclose or put in any application, what they should, what we need information wise, is there anything we want? Um, and then questions about, is that possible with the system and IT and all that we have is, is part of it? Um, or is there a way for some of the information that we might want to not have to have to do it on an application because you can coordinate with other documents and information we already have like the property cards so um you know i i think as we've been doing i i would like to start i know i always seem to put rob and john on the spot here but you guys are the experts and so i'm hoping you've thought about what information you really do need um in terms of applications what do you need from property owners um, to process applications and stuff like that and then are there is there information that you would also want that would help you do things like enforcement and respond to complaints and stuff like that that would be wise to include on any application so that 
we have that information. Rob? Sure, I'll just start this off a little bit. And, um, you know, I think Steve is going to be most familiar with what we currently are asking for, John as well. Um, and John might have some comments about what we need. But um, I think I want to say that we, you know, we have continually adjusted our application questions over the years. Uh, and we, we are so much more sophisticated now with this new program and can very easily ask things like, uh, you know, in the last uh, you know, version of our application, uh, we asked for number of bedrooms and number of bathrooms, you know, just as another uh, data collection point that we can report on or talk about in future years, something that we didn't necessarily collect uh, in the early years of the program because we weren't able to easily. Um, so, you know, we do ask for uh, units, number of units, number of bedrooms, number of bathrooms, uh, and I think uh, have the ability to look for more information if we want to um, have it needed to based on our current bylaw. So I think it really will depend on what happens with this regulation, uh, what happens with the uh, property manager or responsible agent uh, sections, uh, because that'll likely change the questions we ask for. Um, and what will happen with inspections, uh, and that'll certainly change the self-certification. Uh, so I don't have anything specifically that needs to be added to the list right now, but I just wanted to mention that and, and let others give a, have a chance to talk. John? Thanks, Mandy. Um, I did um, take a look at the draft before um, coming to the meeting today, and I like the questions about the owner. We, we ask about that currently and we often get, um, you know, a management company puts their name in there. So uh, cross the bottom of the, for the contacts on a rental uh, permit out in the field, you'll see vertex, 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 vertex with a, with a number that rings through to an answering service. Um, I like the idea that it has to be a monitored line you know, I've been out in the middle of the night at an emergency with students that need to be rehoused, called one of those numbers and gotten a, you know, a recording asking me to leave a message. That's, that's not great, at, you know, in the middle of the night. Thank you for those comments. Um, Steve, do you have anything to add at this time? I think uh, Rob and John probably have it covered. They have uh, more experience than I do in terms of actually uh, addressing the issues with these properties. Um, we did make some changes when we adopted the OpenGov program uh, a couple of years ago um, to include, uh, as Rob mentioned, the bedroom and bathroom count. Uh, that's been helpful, especially in, um, in finding people who list uh, more bedrooms than are typically uh, legally allowed to be rented. Um, but I can't think of, uh, of anything else that's glaringly missing really in our current, our current collection scheme. Um, I want to follow up myself with John and then with Rob with some questions that I have. Um, John, you, liked, you, you mentioned that the draft that we had, the monitored line, the response line, is there, um, you know, I think we pulled that from State College, but it might have been from some other <laughs> jurisdiction, but there were multiple options to choose and it was things like, and I, and I don't know when I drafted that, how much I consolidated or not, but is there a preference, you know, some of these had an email and a phone number that has to be answered within like 20 minutes or something and all, and then another one that's like within a day and stuff like that. Um, are, are there time frames like that that you would like to see that would be helpful? Um, I, I think some of that showed up in the draft bylaw that was referred to us, others may not have. Um, you know, things like that would, would having time frames versus just a monitored line be helpful to require the time frames? Yes, absolutely. Because, you know, that's that situation that I mentioned. We were, you know, an electrical inspector and I were out, um, you know, at midnight responding to an emergency. 
I don't want to wait there for three hours wondering if someone's going to call me back or not. I need, I needed to rehouse those students now. Um, you know, and what I found out afterwards was the university has a monitored line too. They have a dean, a dean who's on duty, you know, over the weekend, but I didn't have that information at the time. I mean, you know, actually, I have a lot of these landlords' cell phone numbers in in my personal phone, and that's that's the best way to get in touch with them. But I don't have them all. Um, and they sometimes don't answer. So yes, maybe maybe a time frame of twenty minutes is a is a good idea. So certainly, cell phones not potentially might be a very good idea too. Um, instead of just even a quote monitored line, requiring since cell phones seem to be ubiquitous. Yeah, I mean, if you call if you call Cayman's Realty, you know they they manage probably fifteen hundred units of of rental housing in town and you're gonna you're gonna leave a message yeah. um i'm gonna ask uh, jennifer and then i'll ask my other question okay so she just said to go ahead so yeah. my other question was to rob which is um more towards the mechanics of a written bylaw you know as as you saw in the one draft um there were specific things that the bylaw required and then it had things like and anything else um, I think we put the building commissioner once, right? Um, and so the question I have for you is, as we move towards writing the bylaw, what stuff would be appropriate for requiring within the bylaw itself versus um, leaving up to you? You know, as bylaws are harder to amend than just an application process, are there some things that you've seen or saw um, that, you know, in terms of requests that we might make or anything that you wouldn't want to see in a bylaw versus just do anyway um, and, and stuff that you would actually want to see in the bylaw language. Well, I think, yeah, I think it's important to make sure the bylaw language addresses, um, you know, the expectations, uh, you know, any of the information that we want to have available to the public uh, anything that we're going to commit to uh, making available publicly, uh, you know, such as the owner information and contact information. And I saw, you know, I saw a list, you know, in the, in the packet of potential things uh, that could be on that. I don't think they all need to be on there necessarily, but certainly if the group decides it's something that's important to have, we should put it into the bylaw. Um, you know, I don't things like what John, you and John were just talking about the expectations of a, of a response time that that absolutely needs to be in the bylaw. Uh, so, you know, we don't want to make it too long. And, you know, we will obviously, you know, be able to uh, create and modify the application itself as needed uh, with information. But um, yeah, I think I think for us, we currently collect what we need to for the current bylaw, and I think that's what I you know keep thinking about is, um, you know, what does the final bylaw look like, and what other questions do we need to ask, and and I just uh, you know we'll continue to think about that as we develop the, the remaining sections. Thank you, Rob. Jennifer, um, is it something that? A suggestion I have about something I'd like to see included. Should I wait till another meeting? No, this is the meeting to talk about those. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, I have two. Um, last night, and we had a John was there. We had a neighborhood meeting. Um, you know, regarding a, a lot related to off-campus ho uh, housing, um, and there's some there's a uh, the university has a module I guess it's online called responsible neighbor workshop is that something we could suggest or I guess we can't require it but it couldn't hurt to have maybe the students if the landlord's renting to students to encourage them to take this I don't know how that if that could be part of a bylaw or John yeah, so interestingly, I met with a landlord this morning. They own a half a dozen properties, and she was telling me that she has designed um, a module like that that she um, requires her 
prospective tenants to take. And I thought I suggested to her that she get in touch with Sally at, at off-campus student housing and, and have module two be attached to their program and just put that, she has it in her lease, you know, that you have to do this thing. Cause uh, here's, here's what it means to live in a house and here's what you might come up against. And um, yeah, I think it's a helpful thing. A lot of these kids have never lived away from home. What do they, they don't know anything about living in a house. Yeah, what I heard about, I didn't know the university offered it and it's easy to do. So but that's just a suggestion. I know we don't have to make a decision now. Um, and then my other, because I know I say this all the time, but I, it would, and it was reinforced more at the, at the meeting we had last night, if we could ask a question about whether it's going to be a, a student house, because the uh, Sally Linowski and uh, Tony Morales were there and they were saying that they, they do, you know, try and visit or keep an eye on the student houses, particularly streets that may have many of them. Um, because I know, you know, the, there's three or four streets in my district where it's almost, there's maybe one non-student um, household on the block. And that's where students actually you know, where there's often emergency medical calls and there's just not a pair of eyes and it would be helpful to know, just to know what's going on, like where the student houses are. And I think even, you know, the university kind of keeps an extra eye if they know that there's really kind of no grown-ups around aside from those houses. And State College Pennsylvania actually has, what do they call it, a student home registry. And they, they actually have a map of where the student houses are. Yeah, thank you for that suggestion, Jennifer. I have a question for you and then a question for Rob related to that. Um, the question for you, Jennifer, is would you be looking for um, an indication as to whether it's any that is whether anyone that is living in that rental is registered at any university or college within, you know, the 20 mile radius um, in any program? Or would you be specifically looking for anyone registered um, in an undergraduate program, or well, would you be looking I mean, for multiple people in any one unit registered versus say, if, if I was a renter and I happened to have a college age student, would I be considered, would, I, would my family be checking that box? So, so I'm trying to get sort of where, what, well, you're what not your renting, thoughts are on so, the scope okay. of it. Right. And well, you're I not renting, so you wouldn't, um, I mean, you're not filling out a rental permit application. Well, but if I was renting, someone would right. be. And well, this I is what um, we can decide what we there. want. So this is I'm reading off um, State College says student home definition. A student home is defined as having living arrangement within one family dwelling, one family dwelling within an apartment or two family dwelling by persons who are unrelated by blood marriage or legal adoption or are attending undergraduate or graduate programs offered by colleges or university or on a semester break or summer break from studies at colleges or university or any combination of such persons. The residents of a student home share living expenses and may live and cook is a single housekeeping unit. Student homes include living arrangements where the landowner or landowners or landowner's family members may reside, may are members of the dwelling. Student homes do not include fraternities, sororities, rooming houses. Um, that's, I mean, we could have our own definition, but they, they get very particular in how they define it. And I guess what I'm asking you is, would you be looking for undergraduate and graduate students or just a notice regarding undergraduates? Um, I would personally be looking for undergraduates because I think there's a world of difference between graduate and graduate students. I mean, I, there is a world of difference, yeah. Okay, and then for Rob and John and Steve, the people who process these applications, one of my concerns with, with that sort of checkbox is not that it's um, appropriate or inappropriate, it's more of, is it possible to do? meaning we have a system where people apply for the permits in May and June, um, and they don't actually have to, depending on how we've worded this bylaw, the current draft that was referred to us said, lease, rent, or offer to lease or rent. So in some sense, you had to have your permit before you even advertised you have something, which means you don't know who's gonna be in there. Um, and so is something with a question like that, um, on a prospective basis, doable um, in terms of what you know of in terms of the 
the timing of the leases in this town in general um, and when the applications come in or and and if that's not would have has your experience been that the in general if a house was rented to say undergraduates last year you know the lease that might be expiring july 1 or whenever it does that it tends to be rented to undergraduates in the lease that comes up to such that potentially asking that question for who just leased it would be just as helpful. I hope that made sense in my question. <laughs> so Rob. Yeah, yeah, I think your question made sense to me and I, and I definitely will turn to John because I know he knows more about the leasing uh, and has, has viewed more leases than I have, but uh, my personal opinion is that we would want to try to capture the perspective uh, tenancy. And even if that meant moving the renewal date a month to do that, uh, from what I understand or what I've, I've seen, uh, it shouldn't be a problem as a July 1st renewal. But you know, I'm hoping John has, maybe has better insight into that on the timing. But uh, it seems like that's easily uh, dealt with by an adjusted renewal date to to capture the majority of the lease cycles that we're familiar with. John or Steve? Yeah, I'll just jump in. Um, I, your, your question does make sense. We absolutely have um, the ability to, you know, put this box in there and get it, get it checked. Um, I am trying to think of a property that went from being a student rental to uh, having a family in it. And I'm, I'm, I'm coming up empty. Um, I don't know that that happens because I think that it's too expensive pretty much for a family to rent one of those houses. You know, the, the idea that you would pay eight or $900 per bedroom uh, for a family, that's, that would be a hard nut every month. Um, and I, and I think that there's, there's really not enough student rental housing as it is. This landlord I talked to today said she's got parents calling up and crying that they can't find any place to house their kids in September. Um, you, you know, I, I think if it's a student rental house now, it's going to be one next time too. Thank you, John. Steven. I think John is uh, is correct in the vast majority of cases. I can just say from my own personal experience, I'm an Amherst resident. I rent a one bedroom apartment. Um, I'm not a student. And I believe the previous uh, tenant of my um, unit was a student. Um, so I can have to say it does happen in some vanishingly rare um, circumstance, but I do think that the majority of the market is is generally targeted towards, um, towards students or, or not. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, and then I have another question related to this potential question. That's okay. Um, my next question is, you know, we're talking about houses here. I think uh, I'm not remembering it, but I think the state college definition included up to a certain size of number of units on the parcel or something. So, so a one bedroom, a, a one family, a single family or a duplex or a triplex maybe. Um, and so um, I guess this is more towards Jennifer, but to others, it, to me, this question seems unmanageable if you're looking at an apartment complex. Right, I agree. If you're looking at even right. potentially a six family, you know, six unit building or something. And so what should be the break on when that question is asked versus when someone doesn't have to answer that question? Jennifer. No, I, I agree because I also think some of the larger buildings have some more better management, or there's some management on site. So it's not, yeah, I agree. There should be, it doesn't have to be for, I, I don't I don't think it's applying to um, when he's pleasant. Rob, what would you think, Rob, John, your experiences with issues relating to rentals, um, is there a certain number of units within a parcel that this would be a helpful question for and then afterwards may or may not help such that is there a logical break for when to say you don't have to answer this question? Rob? 
So I actually thought it's a good question to ask in every application for every development. Uh, and, you know, I saw in the, the draft, I think it was three units or, or uh, you know, three or less units. Uh, but I think, I think it's easy to ask the question. I think it's not that difficult for the, uh, for the landlord to provide that information. I think it could be valuable information. I'm still, you know, wondering how exactly it's going to be valuable for us in the future. But um, interestingly, we're having this conversation, my next meeting at the ZBA that starts very soon tonight. Um, we're talking about this specifically and, you know, we'll be suggesting that the, um, the property owner report to us uh, the number of units that are occupied by students. Uh, so I think that's going to be valuable information for us, for the planners in the future, uh, to decide on zoning, make zoning decisions. Uh, so I'm actually in favor of asking the question, uh, asking a question related to this. I'm not sure exactly how to phrase the question, but uh, you know, something like, you know, uh, maybe pieces of the language that's that's in the draft about uh, units, number of units that are occupied by a student and, and, you know, putting a definition of a student in there. And I'm more interested in that than I would be of establishing a student home license as a different license type. I think that that makes things more complicated, maybe unnecessarily complicated. And in fact, I only the only advantage or reason I saw for doing that in the draft was to potentially charge them a different rate. And if that's what we get down to, maybe there's a way to make it less complicated, uh, but get, gain the information that we're looking for and you know where, and I think um, anyone who's at the ZBA meeting later will hear this, but um, I had these discussions with our town attorney and you know it's interesting how, um, you know, a class of, of individual or a protected class of individuals uh, is so similar in, in legal terms as the type of tenant. And that's what we're discussing, you know, tonight is um, to be careful there because you could in, inadvertently, um, you know, run afoul of a, a protected class or a fair housing matter by um, trying to regulate a type of tenant. So instead of trying to regulate that, uh, we are going to ask for the data about it, you know, ask about it. And we, we feel like legally we can ask those questions. Uh, we, we don't feel like we can say you can't live here or only five of you can live here, but we feel like we can ask who's living there and expect the, the property owner to have to give us that information. And that uh, is something that I had our town attorney research and give an opinion to me on. Thank you for that, Rob. Jennifer. Yeah, no, I would um, agree with Rob. I mean, because it may be in certain units, if you have, you just know that you have a certain number of undergraduates that maybe there's a different management plan that you would want to have in place. Um, I'd like to, and, and I'm going to see if I can pull it up, um, the ECAC ideas for permit applications. Um, let me see if I can pull that up and share it. Because um, I'd like to talk specifically about those if I can even, oh, there it is. Um, so I'd like to hear from, you know, ECAC is our Energy and Climate Action Committee, so they're very interested in finding ways to gather information regarding um, energy uses in, in our rentals and then also energy upgrades in the rentals. And, and I think we can see that from the, the types of information that ECAC provided in terms of ideas for um, application questions or um, application materials or information to include in that. And so I'd really like to hear from John, Steve, and Rob about, and, and obviously the rest of the committee too, about um, some of the information and the proposed information they're seeking and whether um, that would be appropriate for a rental permit application, um, whether some of it can be cross-referenced once you have a, 
address to a property card easily um, or not, um, or whether it needs to be on some sort of the same database to, to be able to be done easily. Um, and, and just your thoughts on some of these questions um, and, and whether appropriate for an application or maybe a completely different bylaw too. Um, I'm not sure what that bylaw would be, but like, should we try to meld things together into one bylaw or, or different? Um, so thoughts from committee members and John, Stephen and Rob would be helpful too. Um, Shalini first. Yeah, I'm happy to, I mean, I'd love to hear from the town staff, of course. Um, from my perspective as a counselor, since we have these goals of climate action goals, I think it's great to incorporate some of these questions. And which questions is, I think my question was going to be to for ECAC is like, what is the purpose of collecting that information? And like, I can see like one of the questions is more education, the purpose of collecting even like, would you be interested in learning about this is to inform people. And that's a big thing actually is like even to let people know and maybe the rental registration form is one other channel through which we can educate and let people know so i can see that's one of the reasons but there are other questions like how many electric vehicle charging stations you have and um, rooftop or you know things like that what is the purpose of asking and then who what are we going to do with that information and who's going to do what with that information i think that's really important before we start putting questions in um, but i would also be interested in like i was mentioning earlier if uh, we can incentivize uh, building owners who are being energy efficient so i think that's one goal to ask some sort of questions um, that would allow us to at some point maybe not right away but at some point figure out if someone is putting in solar or energy efficient, have energy efficient ratings or something, if we can give them some sort of breaks, either inspection or rates or something like that. Thank you, Shalini. Other thoughts? Stephen. Thank you, Mandy. Um, I can say uh, I think a lot. Some of these questions would be uh, very easy and would be a good database for the ECAC to use. Um, some of them might be a little bit more challenging um, in terms of uh, you know linking to the uh, people who might be interested in learning more about energy saving uh, programs. Um, you know, one way we could do that is if they answer yes to the uh, question, we could in, you know put a link that would pop up if they answer yes that they could click on right there. Um, you know, that may or may not be effective depending on, you know, if they're kind of focused on getting that done or not. Um, one thing that I've run into is that a lot of times people won't, the owners won't know that much about their property. They certainly might have, uh, might not know the last time the heating system was renovated or, or what type of insulation is in there. Um, oftentimes as property managers, and especially with the bigger property manager groups, they will have, um, you know, their office staff will submit, you know, however many hundreds of applications they might have. Um, and they probably wouldn't have um, access to that information, and um, and the owners may not as well. Um, it's uh, you know we 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 do have the capability. Um, the IT team does have the capability to kind of cross reference um, some of our rental permit information with assessors' data. Um, the rental permit information lives in our OpenGov system, which was just implemented a couple of years ago. Um, we've almost entirely switched over to that for all uh, inspection services permitting. And it is a, a fantastic system that saves us a lot of time, um, but it is a separate database from the uh, assessor's database, which holds, um, you know, kind of more of our legacy information, a lot of these types of things. I don't think there's any capability in the OpenGov system to, uh, to import that type of information, um, but it is something that, uh, you know, myself working with the IT team to, could do, you know, on a yearly basis, maybe, is to kind of get a list of the rental properties um, and they could try to pull whatever, you know, they could cross reference that list with the assessor's database and pull whatever information there might be there to create a, um, a database if that was if that was useful to somebody. Thank you, Steve. So I'm going to ask 
Rob and John, another question. Some of these are very specific. And as Stephen just said, owners may or may not know. Is this something that would be appropriate for putting into the bylaw for we need these questions? Or is this something that um, you and inspectional services and as building commissioner would prefer to sort of have a little more flexibility than if it's written into the bylaw? Like maybe right into the bylaw energy efficient information regarding, you know, questions regarding energy efficiency and energy usage, and then allowing you to tailor them appropriately or something. John and then Rob. Uh, I think it, it seems like this is the kind of information that you want people to volunteer. You know, they, they want it, you want them to invest in this. Um, I, I think as far as, uh, I don't know that we have any LEED certified um, apartment buildings in town. Um, there are a couple of buildings at the colleges that meet that standard. Um, you know, and some people like, uh, you know, some of Kyle's buildings, certainly they, they have, you know, um, an energy rating and they're, and they're striving to, to hit that target. But most of the stuff that I'm going in and out of, you know, ranch houses and old capes and, um, you know, um, three families, um, they're not gonna, <laughs> what kind of insulation do they have? None, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's pretty dismal. Um, but, I, but I see the value in collecting this for sure. Rob? Uh, yeah, so I think I think the question should probably be less specific, um, and and let us adjust that as needed in the application. So less specific in the bylaw, uh, but certainly to address this topic, uh, I do think you know all of these questions are important. I just would like to know why. You know what what are we asking them for? Um, you know, as Shalne suggested, an incentive later in the bylaw, maybe with you know, having to do with inspections or fees or whatever it might be, uh, absolutely makes sense. I think knowing this information to understand um, how buildings over time are being improved on their own, you know, just to know are there more mini splits or there, you know, uh, you know, less fossil fuels, just having that data, I think is useful. And then, you know, whether or not the town looks for resources to uh, offer programs to developers to, uh, to make upgrades, uh, that would allow us to ask more specific questions, you know, as needed in the year where that might be occurring, or uh, there's an effort to, uh, to implement a program, you know, related to something like mini splits. Uh, so I think, I think it's all good information, uh, but maybe not so specific in the bylaw. Thank you, Rob. John and then Stephen. Sorry, that was a legacy hand raise. Oh, okay, Stephen. <laughs> Thank you, Mandy. Um, I would just, um, from a technical standard, advise against any kind of um, fees being adjusted based on the energy standards of the building. Um, to kind of go a little bit into the weeds on how the uh, the system works. Um, in an ideal world, um, it has a uh, an open gov has been tremendously helpful for our operations, but it's not perfect, and uh, it can be challenging for people who are less tech savvy. Um, and um, in a perfect world, how it works is you can apply for your application. Um, and after the year is done, when it's time to renew, um, we can kind of manage a renewal campaign from our side that will pull in. And even though, you know, on a strict technical level, it's kind of a new file, new application, um, it pulls all the information from the previous one in. And, um, you know, there's ways that we can lock that information. Um, and there's ways that we can allow people to change it generally um, for things like rental permits. I try to let people change it because um, there's all kinds of different things that may change. And if somebody you know, filed a building permit that shows that they might have had some modifications to the building, um, it would take manual cross checking to um, to kind of to kind of verify that and put that into the rental permit. Um, and what's been so valuable from this new program is that it allows us to really tremendously streamline and move through and in previous years where it might take us, you know, in the worst case, four or five months to process the, uh, the backlog of rental permit applications. This new system's allowed us to cut it down to less than a month, which has really been tremendous. But um, I think we'd lose a lot of those gains if we were kind of go to, to cross check, if we were to lock things down and, 
and then um, have to cross check against that. Um, and even with the renewal, the renewal uh, process itself, um, you know, for, for me, for somebody who spent most of the, uh, the COVID lockdown messing around with it, it seemed very simple and very easy. But a lot of people who are less familiar with the system or less tech savvy um, aren't really able to, to find that, that, renewal, um, that renewal system and end up su submitting new applications. Um, so even if we were to make some kind of office use only section of the form that would allow us to mark that kind of thing down, um, if they did then submit a new application, either we'd have to be calling them and walking each person through the renewal process, um, or we'd have to cross check everything. So um, there are some trade offs there. Thank you for that. That reminded me about a question I had, which is renewals. Um, <laughs> and it, it seems like that's obvious. So maybe uh, one, one thing ECAC said or others are, do the renewals have to ask the same questions? And it sounds like with the system we're using, it doesn't matter because they're already populated. If, if, if the people use them correctly, yes, they would al already be populated. Um, and um, you know, some people are, are do, do that, some people don't. Um, I mean, there have been times where we have kind of not even done the renewal at all. Um, and we built out the food license application, actually. This was when we were still pretty new to the system. And we ended up um, being a little bit more ambitious than the system was able to handle. I mean, if you go into the food code, the, uh, the food application, has all different kinds of questions that it asks. And we tried to put everything in there. It's probably a 20 something page application on paper. Um, and that didn't really end up working out in open gov. And we tried to put that in because it became so long and cumbersome um, that it loaded very slowly and it was difficult for staff to use. And we ended up actually um, changing that system around to really just kind of take the, um, take the, you know, the basics, the things that we'd want to be able to run quick reports on, um, you know, email addresses, phone numbers, things like that. And then we had a paper supplement that new restaurants would fill out um, that would take in all those kind of initial application type questions. You know, what, 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 what are the walls made out of? You know, where does the drain go? Those kinds of things. Um, and, um, and that actually worked really well as, as a more hybrid um, type of system. Thank you. Shalini. I, I saw in some of the other towns where they had point system, like, you know, if there's a certain problem then, or good or bad, but there are points. So I wonder if this energy efficiency will go towards one of the positive points that go to, yeah, that's all. Which you bring up a good question. If we based fees on points, is that something, Stephen, that would be able to be managed through OpenGov somehow? Um, you know, if, it, as Shalini said, sometimes there's there's systems out there that say, oh, if you've had a new noise call, you get five points. Um, and when you hit eight points or something, you can't actually renew your license, you know, or, you know, it might get suspended for the next year or for six months or things like that. Um, is that something, the issuance of those points, is that something that could be managed through OpenGov a into this system of permit applications such that on a renewal, the point numbers would show up. And so if you then based, as I'm randomly thinking here, if you then on Shalini's thoughts based, oh, a, a house or a property that has had two points has, you know, two or less points has this fee, 10 or more points has this fee that's a lot higher because, you know, they cause more staff time usage and all, could that be managed through an open gov system or would that be sort of not manageable? It, it may be possible. It would be challenging and not something we've done before. Um, it would certainly take a lot more staff time and attention to that type of thing, which is a trade-off. I mean, you know, that's, that's what we're here for is to, uh, is to put, put work towards this, but um, it would be challenging and, um, and um, kind of, working the system in a, in a way not exactly as it's designed, but it, it may be possible. Thank you, Shalini. Yeah, and we'll have to think through, or I mean, the staff will have to help us or figure out how, because I'm imagining if it's positive points for energy efficiency, but negative points for noise or other stuff, they can't cancel each other out. You know, they have they're two separate things. <laughs> so you can't say like, overall, this score is really good. You know, it'll have to be its own buckets somehow. Sounds like we're going to have to think about that as we mm. draft other portions of the bylaws to whether that's a logical thing to do. Um, 
Shalini? One other thing, yeah, maybe the easy you know, probably like how are other towns or if our staff knows how are other towns, what are the best practices of promoting energy efficiency in rental bu buildings? If there's already other towns that have systems in place, um, we could just borrow from that. We can ask that of ECAC mm -hmm. if when I contact Steve Roof and send stuff back to him. Thank you. Anything else regarding applications, application process, things like that? Um, Stephen. This is a bit of an odd point, but it just popped into my head as I was um, reviewing uh, the draft on the other screen here, and um, we can, I think we can kind of take this or leave this, but I do note that uh, the draft requires uh, submission of email addresses, um, and there are probably five or five to seven people in town who, um, who submit rental permits on an annual basis who don't use email or don't use computers, um, and up until now we've been able to accommodate them on paper, um, and uh, just, just something to think about. That's a good point. So thank you for that. Um, anything else before we move on? Seeing none, um, I, I want to thank Rob and John and Stephen um, and Chris for staying on. I know she didn't say anything, but for staying on and listening um, to this conversation um, and these thoughts about applications um, and permitting and, and requirements for the applications and all um, as we move forward on everything. In two weeks, we will have, I, I will work on the draft language for those sections of the bylaws for two weeks from now based on the conversation we had um, today. And so we will review potential language. Um, it, it will start based on what was in the draft that was referred to us um, and be modified as as discussed today in some sense to, to review some additional language. We will also have additional language for many other sections that are much smaller sections um, that didn't need a full discussion before seeing language because it's more basic standard sort of language in bylaws. So Jennifer and then Michelle. No, I actually just want to thank you because we do have these conversations and, and you get them all on paper. I don't know. So anyway, <laughs> thank you because we would be lost. <laughs> it's, it's nice to have an attorney also that's your chair. <laughs> Understand all this. Thank you. Michelle. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry. I may have missed this um, discussion at the beginning, but have we come back to the, the idea of doing some sort of forum or hearing? I, I'm i pretty consistently now getting emails and talk to, you know, when I'm out um, about this and folks wanting a clear channel um, to communicate concerns and ideas. And so it's really ramped up for me recently. I don't know if you're all having that experience. And I, my concern is I don't want to treat anyone differently. You know, like I, I, I may run into someone and have a little more time to speak to them. And then I get emails and I, I might not have adequate time to respond. I just, I want to give everybody an equal opportunity to uh, provide feedback. Thank you, Michelle. Um, last meeting, we discussed that and we were thinking potentially in June, depending on whether there was a Monday available, if not move to one of the Mondays in July, that is not a council meeting. Um, and Shalini and I, Shalini was going to propose something to me. We haven't had a chance to meet yet, but Shalini's got her hand up. So maybe she's got some other things in order to do that. Uh, Shalini. Yeah, I, I'm definitely going to, uh, you know, we should connect Mandy Jo, but I really do uh, appreciate, Michelle, your um, question and suggestion. And I think that what I would love to see happen also is that we have one place where uh, all of this material and discussions, videos, you know, just the way we have an engaged website 
for projects and maybe it's not an engagement that's a question i'm going to be saying you know ask paul to meet with paul and brianna and ask them like can we house all of the questions all of the paper you know the documents video links all of that in one place um and maybe dave that's something you can answer i don't know or the technique i don't know like if there's one place where we can direct people if they want to know where to find what information or meetings or want to watch one of these videos or the public hearings all all of that is housed on in that one page I've spoken, I, I, I love that idea, and I just will share that I've spoken with Brianna about this in relation to reparations, actually, and mm -hmm. setting up a place on Engage AMA. Uh, and actually, it's, there are so many fantastic options available there. And uh, from what I can tell, you can put everything in one place. It's visually appealing. Mm -hmm. There are ways to... Um, allow for people to actually leave comments that are also viewable by the public um it's, it's really engaging and it's mm -hmm. it's something that i think just connecting with brianna and, and as you said paul and um asking for for that for support with that i think would be a great first step for us in this process thank, thank you sir. jennifer so this would be no i think it's a great idea um so we could if if there was like a public comment specifically you know some vehicle online related just to this bylaw that we could let people our constituents know is there that they is that yeah i think i think that's what shalini is trying to figure out um we had talked shalini and i with the umass group about doing it through amherst talks but i don't know where that stands right now um shalini might know better but engage amherst might be a possibility my only concern is who manages it yes, yeah. <laughs> you know um which committee member is willing to take the time to put everything up, gather everything, monitor mm -hmm. all the comments, answer questions, all of that. Um, uh, or would it be a staff member? And is there any time for the staff members to do it when it's really the committee that's managing this process? Obviously, we're relying on John and Rob and Steve and, and Chris and all and, and our departments to give us information about what they need and what they want to see. But it really is, in some sense, the committee drafting the stuff. So that's the concern I have is um how does it get managed and by who and how much time that takes um but i can explore with dave um i can at least talk to him about that potential but michelle you're muted michelle And she just disappeared. I think she was on a phone, so maybe she came out of range. Um, Shalini. Yeah, we can definitely use um, Amherst Talks as well, which is the UMass. Um, but I was just thinking long term whether we, you know, which one we want to use and whatnot. Uh, and I think it can be made clear that that place will be not to go back and because we're not supposed to have a counselors can't have a discussion. I think. Uh, open meeting law, but it, it but we can make that clear that this is a place for the community to give their feedback and then uh, we can just collect and the we meaning we figure out who that we is to collect that information, but I think that's like we want information and no, so. I, I'm not saying we don't, but if I know, you're I agree. putting mm. um, committee meetings online, they need cut or they need posted to a specific part of a meeting so that it goes directly to the part of the meeting where that conversation happened. There's there's mm. a lot of work that goes into getting all the documents and all the videos and all yeah. of that in one place. And that's what I'm saying is yeah, yeah, that yeah. we need to discuss as to who is doing that because I think Shalini, you underestimate mm. how much time that actually takes. Oh, no, 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 I'm not <laughs> underestimating. I totally appreciate you for doing all that for the CRC. Um, yeah okay let's talk about that a little yep. bit offline and try to figure out how what sort of help I, we can I, i'll 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 work with dave to to talk 
um, mm. to figure something out, to have some information and potential options or answers for the next meeting. I've added it to my to-do list. Mm -hmm. um, with that, we're going to move on in our agenda. Um, I did just hear from, oh, Steve was in the audience. Steve, did you have anything to add? I don't know when you showed up. Um, we are concluding our conversation on ECAC and application and all the requirements. Um, so Steve, if you have anything to add before we move on to public comment, um, please do so. I don't know how long you've been here. I've tried to watch the attendees. <laughs> I, I just showed up. I had um, some family obligations, so I I guess I don't have any comments. I'll check the notes to see what I missed. And, and I will touch base with you on that because I know we had some questions for ECAC that we were hoping to send back to ECAC. So okay. I, I will touch base with you on that. But thank you for showing up, even if it was late. <laughs> we yeah, appreciate sorry about that. the collaboration yeah, and what ECAC sent over to us for this conversation because it gave us some things to talk about. Okay, great. Um, Good. So with that, we're going to move to public comment. Um, public, uh, any members of the public are able to um, comment on matters within the jurisdiction of CRC at this time. You can express your views for up to three minutes. Um, and CRC generally does not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised in public comment. If you would like to make a public comment at this time, please raise your hand. Seeing no hands raised, we're going to move on to minutes. Um, we have the May 12th meeting minutes in the uh, packet. Um, so I'm just going to make the motion to adopt the May 12th meeting minutes as presented. Is there a second? Sorry, I was gulping. Yes, second. <laughs> Shall we <Shall> second? <laughs> Are there any discussion changes? Um, discussion regarding that motion? Seeing none, we're going to vote. Mandy is an aye. Uh, Jennifer? Aye. And Shalini? Yes. Those are adopted unanimously with two absent. Um, announcements? I don't really have any announcements that don't relate to agendas. There is a meeting, a special meeting next week, June 2nd at 4.30 p.m. Uh, before Chris and Stephen, Rob's already gone. He goes very quickly. Thank you all for coming. Um, we appreciate it. We will probably see a few of you in two weeks um, at our next regular meeting, but I will be in touch with everyone for what that agenda looks like and who needs to be here or should be here and all. Um, so, but thank you, Steve and Chris, for your time today. Um, and Steve Roof, too, because we're, <laughs> we're, I will touch base with you, Steve Roof, um, regarding ECAC and stuff like that. Um, June 2nd at 4.30 p.m. is a special meeting of CRC. It is where we will be interviewing the applicants for the planning board and then also discussing those interviews and those applications and making a recommendation to the town council on the two impending vacancies um, for the planning board. I keep calling them impending vacancies because they are not technically vacant until the end of June. July 1, they technically become vacant, but we are basically looking to appoint two members to the planning board beginning July 1. Um, that meeting will start at 4.30 p.m. The packet is posted online, both in SharePoint and in on the website. It got posted today. Thank you so much, Athena, for not only forgetting. I thought I'd sent her the email on Monday for that posting, and I never did. And she was on top of, where is it? It needs posted today. So we, we did not mess that up despite the fact that I never sent the email I intended to. Um, so that is June 2nd. That is the only thing that will be on that agenda. Um, June 9th is a regular meeting. At this point, I believe the only things on that agenda are residential rental bylaw and anything we need to do for ZBA, um, which at this point, I'm not sure will be anything because we did pass interview questions and other things today. And so we'll definitely get an update and all. Right now, the plan is, if possible, to do ZBA applicant interviews on the 23rd. Um, there may be other things on the next agenda. I just don't quite know right now. Um, but that's sort of the plan for the next two to three meetings. Shalini and then Jennifer. Yeah, it's okay if I leave, I have a district meeting. Um, once you leave, we have no quorum, so we <laughs> I have to meeting. Too. 
So, I so this is the thing. That was my agenda preview. If there is nothing <laughs> else, you. I will be adjourning the meeting. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank Bye. you all for sticking through it and for mm -hmm. us getting it done by 6.30. So yeah. the meeting's adjourned at 6. It just turned to 6.30, 6.30 p.m. Thanks. Bye. Have a nice Thank night. Thank you all very much. Bye.